Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with me, Christian Harris. Mental health and well-being is a topic that affects us all, and it's exactly that that we discuss today with our guest, Petra Veldspur. She's had a really interesting background, and she shares that story with us on this recording of a Safety Roundtable session, which, as always, is interactive and engaging. Do go ahead and get Petra's book, really highly recommend that. Uh, do look out for her second book coming out about digital well-being too, and go and check out her TED Talk. Uh, but only do that after you've enjoyed this episode with myself and Petra uh, disrupting well-being. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week, we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints, and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms, and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today's Safety Roundtable session. Uh, Going to be talking about a really important and interesting topic today, one that affects us all uh, and one that um, I think we can learn a lot from our uh, guest about today, who's got a really interesting backstory, um, which I'm sure she'll talk to us a little bit about as we get going. Um, this, as always, is an interactive session. So if you're joining us on Zoom, then feel free to go to reactions, raise your hand uh, and we'll call you up and you can have a chat uh, with Petra and I. Uh, if you're watching us on LinkedIn or YouTube or wherever and you want to ask a question, then uh, feel free to type something in the chat. Uh, I'll do my best to be monitoring that as we go. Uh, but I'd always encourage people to join us on the Zoom because that is the best way to uh, make the most of the session. Um, if you haven't come to a safety roundtable before, just quickly, uh, it's very much designed to be an interactive um, experience. So we cover a different topic each two weeks. It could be me, like today, with a guest, or me talking about something uh, and then opening up to a discussion. Um, so do get involved and do share the word and get um, other colleagues and safety risk related friends involved as well. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our guest, Petra. Um, Petra, you have got a really interesting story and journey. Um, could you just give us a quick overview of that and kind of why that led you down this path around mental health and well-being? Absolutely. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, all the people who who are joining for this really important topic. Um, so I'm a mental health consultant, psychotherapist, and a coach, and I work with organizations uh, to help them create mentally healthy organizations. So to think, what does good look like and how do we get there? Um, but like many of us in the mental health space, it's deeply personal. Uh, and um, I, so I was born and raised in a religious cult, uh, one of the worst ones out there, apparently. I think it's in, I think it's like number 29 of the top 100, I don't know, according to some sort of list. Um, but what's interesting is throughout my journey, um, seeing similarities between how I grew up, which arguably was quite uh, toxic, and workplaces today, you know, the hierarchy of leadership and, and, and the way we don't question things and just sort of go along with them. And so my story is very much, um, you know, I was born into this reality, so thought this was the, the normal way of living. And it was in my sort of late teens and early 20s that I then spiraled into, oh my goodness, I've been lied to, like nothing's true. And I didn't go to school as a kid. Uh, we traveled all over the world. In case you're wondering where my somewhat Canadian accent is from, I'm not Canadian, I'm Dutch, but I grew up in India, Brazil, Russia, all over the place. And I guess I had to hit my own rock bottom moments um, with uh, addiction and depression and, and poor mental health in order to then, I guess, teach myself first, like how do I build my own resilience, my mindset? And then I realized that we could have a ripple effect and create change with, with those around us and workplaces kind of became a, a thing I'm quite passionate about. That's the short version. 
that's the short version. Um, yeah. You've got a book, haven't you? Do, do you do you go into the more detail in your book into that? I really that do. So yeah, so you can see yeah. it there. So be, begin with you is is my first book, and I, I do go into some story, and of course I'm open to questions if people have them. Um, and I do have a second book coming out, which is around tech addiction and digital well being. So I'm quite excited about that, given how I guess disconnected many people are feeling both at home and at work. Yeah, that's interesting. I and mean, that's that that is a topic that um, resonates with me because I've got two young kids and I'm sort of trying to guard against that. So maybe let's um, touch on that um, a bit a bit later on. Um, so from the perspective of obviously what you went through, you mentioned the, the two words resilience and mindset. Um, how important are those to, I guess, you know, getting on top of this subject uh, and, and and overcoming it from a sort of personal perspective? I mean, hugely. I talk a lot about how we need to take response. What I learned is we we can, in fact, take responsibility for our mental health. So often the narrative is, you know, it's a, a chemical imbalance and it's just sort of on this side of things if you're depressed or anxious. But very often, not always, but very often it's about lifestyle and it's about what's going on um, around us that's mm. affecting us, right? Maybe not living the fullest version of our life and we're depressed because it's easier in a way to feel that way than to do something different about it. And so for me, I certainly was stuck in what I would call a victim mindset. You know, hey, I didn't go to school. I was then 22 and had was pregnant. I moved to London. So I was outside of the cult, but really um, uh, kind of lost all my support network other than my partner who would go to work. And uh, there I was thinking, how do I do life not having gone to school? So there's some tactical things like getting sober taught me how to be honest and how to be accountable, going to sort of recovery groups, which was was very useful for me. And then I learned slowly that the way we think, we don't have to believe all of our thoughts. What a revelation, right? <laughs> and we can actually train our brain to think differently, right? And so for me, it had to get really bad. In fact, the story goes, and this is my reality, that I woke up one day and I had two young kids downstairs and I was in the in the throes of alcohol addiction and, and just the worst place of, of depression. And I remember waking up as if it was yesterday, sort of staring at the ceiling, uh, thinking, this is it. Like, I can't do another day. Like, I, I was ready to check out. I was I was feeling suicidal. And for some reason that day, a second thought popped into my head. And that second thought, and this is not advice, it's just my story. The second thought was, what if I postpone taking my life by one year? And I don't know why that kind of timeline came into play or what happened, but for some reason, it freed me up to experiment with all the things that people said could support your mindset and your mental health. And these days, I know it's almost like information overload, even with well-being practices, right? Do all these, you do 25 things before 7 a.m. or 5 a.m. for some of us, right? In order to hustle well-being. And yeah. I think it's really overwhelming us. So for me, I ended up without realizing what I was doing, doing one small thing every day, the tiniest thing, and then just kind of going, does this work? Does this not work? Is it helping? Is it not helping? And so for me, this is never overnight success, is it? It's 20 years of trying to think differently, getting back up and support. And that's what then the outcome is resilience. You don't just practice resilience, you get resilience through doing the other bits of work. Hmm. Loads and loads to unpack there. Um, given the audience is primarily going to be safety risk management professionals who are overseeing um, that and a lot of them, I guess, would incorporate well-being within their organizations i'm really interested to go down that rabbit hole a bit of what you said about kind of the environmental factors here so it's not you know it's kind of what the what are the things that are affecting you because i suppose that's what the audience are going to be able to try and influence and control they can't force people to think in a, in a certain way and, and so on but they can sort of start to control this environment around us i mean environment is is key and i think safety professionals understand almost more than other people what prevention means because mm. you've been sort of working in that with that mindset for a longer time than people in the mental health space have been. So this idea of what is a mentally healthy culture or take away mentally and just say, what is a healthy culture, right? And so our environment has to, has an impact as far as safety, what you're thinking, mm. but also 
to be mentally healthy, healthily safe, it's the psychosocial risks, right? So it's like, how are we thinking about our managers, the type of language that we use? Um, if people feel isolated, how do we sort of proactively connect and create a sense of belonging? So there's there's many things to think about with prevention and then just team. So again, we're, we're more isolated than ever. And I know people are working in a variety of, of contexts, but there's so much change these days. And there's so many people struggling with a variety of things that if we come at it from that prevention perspective, that is our environment. It's our emotional environment and our physical environment. Yeah. And um, I see Tamara's got a hand up. I'm just going to ask a, a question and then I'll bring Tamara in. Um, so how good, I don't know if good is the right word, but how, how well, um, even if that may, may not be the rest best or other, but sort of how well is the average organisation doing then on this, you know, <clears throat> based on your experience? You know, are we, um, you know, uh, on average, a, a four out of 10 or a six out of 10 or a, where, whereabouts are we? So I think it's tricky to put a number on it because the bigger the organization, I would hesitate to put one number on the entire organization yeah. often, right? It's often departmental. It's often team focused. You can have a really psychologically safe team because that leader or manager is that buffer between any toxicity and really invests in their people and creates safe spaces. Um, and you can have um, a, a more of a toxic workforce on the whole, right? So it's more mm -hmm. about you would might grade on pockets within the business. And so for, for the people here, I'd really think, what is my sphere of influence, right? Am I kind of senior leadership sort of leading from the top? Or am I in a department where I have a little bit of influence, but not loads, right? So how do we create um, change from within and start there and then create our, our ripple effect outwards? Okay. We'll talk a bit more about some strategies and principles uh, that we can take away uh, in a minute. But Tamara, did you want to unmute and, and ask a question? Hi. Yeah, no, um, I was hoping that you would take it exactly where you started to take it, Petra, about the pockets, the teams, right? Um <clears throat> This is a very daunting topic. I've I've actually had to navigate. Um, a, a kind of we we term it working uh, working functioning alcoholics for a reason in the workplace, yep. um, yep. as well as individuals who were um, going down the path of of wanting to be suicidal, right? And so um, that's the kind of thing that as health and safety professionals, we're being um, more and more aware of, I think. It's always been there. It's not that it's not been there, but I think that we're having more discussions around it. So um, if you could share with us from your side of the, the perception, mm -hmm. what could health and safety professionals be doing to better support those who are struggling? Great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I think firstly, and maybe some of you do this already, I think suicide awareness training of some kind is crucial. Um, sorry, uh, Tamara, just were you going to add something? Yeah, carry on. Yeah, just uh, suicide uh, training is not um, required, actually, just to right. share that thank with you. you. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So from my perspective, I think suicide awareness training should be required is what I'm trying to say, I guess, and just mm -hmm. gauging where people are at. Um, but at the same time, and when I sort of talk on stage and, and sort of share slides and that sort of thing, I really kind of highlight that um, often suicide awareness training is focusing on more obvious signs and symptoms and not necessarily thinking about how do we normalize this conversation in general? Because the person Person who might be struggling the most um, it is not it might be your highest performer, might not show on their face, might not be withdrawn or the classic kind of suicidal symptoms, right? There's often a whole range of, you know, when, when people pass this way, unfortunately, very often they're described as the life and soul of the party, the person other people went to for advice or support, you know. So when I talk about prevention, I'm talking about normalizing conversations around this, but also as leaders and managers, how do we check in on people effectively? And if you do suicide awareness training, you'll know that um, there's a lot of fear about asking a direct question when it comes to this topic, but actually all the evidence suggests 
suggest that asking a direct question is the most useful thing to do. And you might say it in a way, you know, that's make sure that the person is safe and comfortable. But I'd say something like, you know, I could be totally wrong. So I kind of put that phrase out there first. I could be totally wrong, but I'm worried about this, this, and this. And I just want to check in. And even if they back off and they say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Because, you know, there's lots of stigma and taboos out there. Hmm. Um, you have still planted a seed as being someone who's trustworthy that when, if they are ready to talk to someone, you might be the person that that they go to. Um, I mean, a huge topic, just the, the suicide awareness piece. But I also think Pro formally and informally having ways to check in on our people. And I think, you know, I've, I've got a, a, a guy who works in my team who's um, worked on construction sites and he talks about going through a mental health struggle and then, um, you know, shooting his hand with a, with a, with a gun, you know, like a nail gun, sorry. Um, so he had a physical health condition or issue that, that health and safety would, would have to consider, but actually it was his mental health that put him in that state of mind for that to happen. So mm. just kind of connecting all the dots to know that these things are connected. And really, I wish it was required that we had some kind of training for you guys to, to go in deep on this topic. Mm. Thanks for the question. Yeah, no, thanks, Tamara. Um, I, I attended a uh, event and somebody was speaking. I should actually get her on to the to, to the podcast or one of these events to to talk about this uh, from from a big organization. And they had surveyed their staff, and we're talking in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands around the world. And perhaps this was my ignorance, but I was really staggered by this. Um, of the under forties, I think it was under forties. It was something like over 53, 54%, just over half of people had had some kind of suicidal ideation. And that that just sort of took my breath away because if if it had been, you know, had some mental health struggles, I would, I would have thought that would be low. But for it to have gone that f far, in my mind, I was really taken aback by that. And And we know that these days things like financial stressors, um, you know, the 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 news, the the geopolitical um kind of challenges that people are facing, all of this is kind of stacking digital um health is all stacking on top of people and really sometimes feeling making them feel like they're in um backed in a corner and there's no no other way out. And it's and and I remember having two young kids and my brain told me they would be better off without me. And you think mm. you're a mother, you're a parent, like, of course, that wouldn't be the case, but it but it was. And unless you've been in that situation, you don't quite understand how the brain can play tricks on you. Mm. And so I quite um, openly talk about this as a, a concept in general with people so that it isn't just this scary topic that we only touch on when we've had the worst news or something terrible has happened. Yeah, it's you yeah. know it's interesting that you, that you say that under forty. I would be interested in what is the the numbers for um, above fifty when people are going through aging changes for like menopause or finding out that they might be a type two diabetes or other health um, other health issues, right? Which is again topics we don't talk about, but it can be very depressing as you age and your body is is um, becoming your worst enemy, if you will, and the thoughts that go through your head there. So it's all through different steps of life. And I think that as health and safety professionals, it doesn't mean that we're health and we're mental health workers and we start dealing in deep with people's mental health. But I, I'd be very supportive of the idea of us becoming aware. What are your thoughts around that? What can we be doing to help create more of an environment where it's, it's normalized to just talk about these things? You touched on that a little bit. Yeah, and I love that you say that. And um, Chris, if you don't mind, I see this um, just comment from, from Vincent as well. That yeah, I, think I was going to, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of touches on the same point. So, so that prevention piece, um, and of course, it would be better to uh, just to read your your quote: identify, then eliminate the work causes of suicide ideation, rather than wait until the person is ready to end their lives. Absolutely, prevention is always better than cure. And unfortunately, when it is goes very to the extreme, it's hard to catch it sometimes, and and we often miss it. 
Um, so how do we normalize conversations just about the human experience? To Tamara's point, you know, menopause, aging, you know, what people who have kids, people who have illness in their family, there's a whole range of things that we all experience, right? And I would say that there can be work causes of suicide ideation, such as people being very isolated, uh, not having much autonomy, um, a toxic boss sort of bullying, or, you know, we can think of those more, more um, sort of day-to-day -day things that might happen in the workplace, unfortunately. But also it's a question of how somebody thinks and what support is outside of work as well as inside of work. So I, I'm always hesitant to say it's one side or the other. Because many managers are like, they need to sort out their personal stuff. And, and then on that side, it's like, hey, there's work context as well that we need support with. So certainly we need to normalize conversations in the workplace, but also there's something about connection. Now we know that um, the male suicide rate is higher than, than female. We know that in these the types of industries you guys work in, there's a high male demographic and talking is just a little bit harder, right? It's not kind of normalized. Um, but there's ways that we can do, we can open conversations that are actually meeting people where they're at. And um, there's amazingly in the UK and moving across the globe, like loads of men's groups popping up. There's the proper blokes club, there's talk club that, that goes in a, that's in a bar, you know, there's like places where um, guys can kind of get together and create that community and support. And I would usually ask guys or and women, I would ask all people, do you have two to five people in your life that you can fully be yourself with? And unfortunately, the statistics are often people have one or zero people, right? So this is what I want to talk about is connection and then creating those spaces where we can go beneath asking about the weather, the weekend or football, please, and actually use those as a gateway into a deeper conversation. Yeah, I hope that, <clears throat> I hope that answered um, Vince, your, your point. Um, Christian, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, just mute. Just unmute yourself. Go on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I just want to dwell on um, uh, a little bit of what uh, she said about uh, sorry, I didn't really get her name. Petra. I, That's uh, okay. Oh, uh, Petra, you okay? Good, thank you. Yeah, uh, you look great. Thanks. Okay. I just want to dwell on the part uh, you mentioned about having uh, uh, friends you discuss with uh, on a more deeper level. I think that as well, uh, we have a good and effective interpersonal relationship at work. Yeah, uh, this is something that is really going to help because not, not everybody will want to share what they are going through <coughs> to everyone. So it's important that uh, that uh, area of skill and the workforce is really looked into, you know, especially before teams are set up in every organization. So it's important that uh, um, every organization, uh, mostly uh, high risk uh, sectors, they tend to ensure that area of skill is um, in, in place and is fully implemented, good interpersonal relationship skills. So this will actually help people to, to um, uh, relate better and they can actually share things that are actually bothering them because of whatever personal issues you could be having will definitely reflect on your performance at work. So it's important that that particular area is looked into. Uh, and um, uh, the area of um, being observant, yeah, uh, one of our, our coll uh, colleagues mentioned that it's also very key. You know, it's important we we are observant of, uh, you know, just we check over uh, people's expression because some people might even be close uh, with uh, the team, but they might still be finding it difficult to share. So maybe what we do is to uh, be observant, look at the expression, look at the performance, and know what is happening. So because I've heard of situations where the work was so stressful and there was a particular guy that went to the loo and uh, he actually slumped. You know, in you know, in, in the toilet. So things like that, we should be observant about that too. And um, you know, in every organization, I will also advise that uh, HSC team have a, an effective uh, collaboration with the HR team. 
you know, that's the human resource team, you know, it's important so we can actually go through our colleague, you know, especially the technical guys, you know, you know, and of course the uh, uh, administrative guys are also very important, you know, but, you know, let's go work with the HR team. So we look at uh, the leave rosters of these, our colleagues and ensure that our leave rosters are effectively implemented because you just see folks just, uh, Uh, you know, there are some guys that love the job so much and they just want to leave the job, but probably because of stress from the work, you know, it's actually affecting their mental, uh, mental health. So I think one area of ensure that leave rules that are actually not just uh, uh, documented, but actually implemented. So this is where the HA and the HSC team work, uh, have a good uh, collaboration with the um, HR team to ensure that uh, um, the rules that are, uh, leave rules that are actually implemented. This will actually give a opportunity for them to rest You know, see how they can uh, relax and, uh, you know, and uh, so the stress level, you know, because sometimes when there are mental issues, maybe like you said, some uh, some boss that could actually be bossy, you know, so probably when you stay off the work for a certain week and rest, then, you know, and of course, during the process of that rest, there should be, you know, check, check up. You know, we can, like you know, our colleague said, we're not like a mental health organization, but uh, It's important we check on ourselves, and that's where the uh, effective, good interpersonal communication skills is not like uh, uh, we, we, uh, is actually being implemented in. And um, I think uh, please, Christian, uh, that's 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 great. We'll let we'll let Petra answer that because there's quite a lot there. I had to take notes because uh, there was lots yeah. to to respond to, but really good to see you trying different things and and understanding the fundamentals of of interpersonal skills. Um, so a couple of things. People want to, people need to feel seen, heard, and valued. So they might not want to tell you their whole life story. They might never want to go to the workplace or the safety team and tell their whole life story, but we can help them feel seen, heard, and valued by noticing something that they've said or making it personal and not just um, about work sometimes, right? So, it, and, and we want that as well, no matter who we are, right? So there's another piece just around psychological safety. So how do we build psychological safety so that people who do want to talk can feel safe enough to do so and comfortable? But there's an interesting thing about how you build trust. You can read all the books and there's a great one called The Fearless Organization by uh, Amy Edmondson on the topic of psychological safety. But there's this thing, you build trust by leading by example. You build trust by bringing a little bit of yourself into the conversation and into the connection yourself. Very often safety, HR, even leaders will think, well, my job is to make that person feel safe and to tell them they can come to me. But the way human interaction works is it's both sides. Um, you bring a bit of yourself, you lead by example in saying something like, it doesn't always have to be crisis, right? It can be Um, oh, I got a terrible night's sleep last night because I really am not well or, or my child was awake or whatever. And that's really affecting my focus today. I really need your backup. So you're, you're saying like you're connecting the dots between your physical and mental health and your performance, right? Um, and it could also be asking people things like not just what's wrong today, but what's one thing that's going well today? I think we all need a little bit more uplift in thinking about good mental health, not just bad mental health. If you mm. think of, you may have seen the mental health continuum, which is basically we move up and down depending on what's going on in our life. In the middle is survival. Then we've got thriving and excelling. And on the other sides are crisis and struggling. But so often when we think mental health, we're just thinking about crisis and struggling. And we're not thinking, what is the environment that will help people to thrive? And then finally, to your points around HR and safety working together. Oh, my goodness. It's the biggest frustration of my life that people who want to look after other people who are in the same organization feel like they're in silos or working against each other, right? Like, because they're maybe competing for budgets or maybe they have a slightly different agenda. And really, 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 it's um, ideal for culture and engagement, leadership, HR and safety to, of course, uh, be coordinated in how they're supporting their people. Yeah, good old silos, can't, can't beat those. Oh. Um, <laughs> one thing that I... Was interested by in, in this um, this question from Christian was the the piece around work because I mean it might just be my experience um, but I feel like 
when I was in kind of professional services before I got involved in what I do now, um, I would have felt quite stronger than awkward. I, I would have felt uncomfortable kind of raising this in, in, with a colleague because there was this kind of competitiveness and this kind of excellence. And I don't know, maybe that was just, you know, maybe that's me rather than, than, than the way that it is. But I'm just interested to hear like, you know, do you do you find people are kind of more willing to open up to colleagues at work or people in the workplace rather than, you know, away from work, given that there's that kind of dichotomy of, you know, we want to be um, helpful and, and be well and so on, but there's also potentially, you know, I'm going for this promotion and so on and so forth. I think everybody's different. There's some mm. common themes, but it kind of depends on industries. Like you said, professional services. If I, if I work in law firms, I'm like, everyone's been competitive since the day they graduated from anything. And even then it's so ingrained to be a particular way. So some people find, then this is the interesting thing when managers are, are thinking, oh, if we talk about mental health, everyone's going to take time off and nobody's going to get the job done is a, is a classic sort of fear. Um, but we need to think that, you know, actually having conversations, work can be a protective factor for some people. They might go home to a flat on them, their own because they've just got divorced and they're mm. sitting with, with the booze and whatever, right? The unhealthy coping mechanisms. So sometimes for some people, work is that protective factor where they're like, oh my goodness, I have a rapport with my safety team or a rapport with my manager or even a mate, you know, so, you know a colleague, someone that you work with. That might be the only place I feel seen, heard, and valued. And for other people, that boundary is pretty strict. I want to show up at work. I'm competing there, you know, and I'm going to talk to my wife or my partner or a friend outside of work or a therapist or a coach, whatever it might be. It, so, so we need to get away from, you know, three-step formulas that are supposed to apply to everyone, right? And actually create space for individuality and just getting to know our people. It's actually really simple but not easy, right? Mm. To spend that one minute where you're not in a meeting, where you're not rushing around to just say, hey, what's really going on for you? What's I? This is a real question I ask my team. What's one challenge you're facing at the moment, either personally or professionally? We actually ask each other, how's your mental health today? Because that's how extreme yeah. we are, right? Yeah. So there, there are other ways, but I guess you, you've got to move from where you are and one step kind of further and take people along with you. Yeah, yeah. Tamara? I get what what you're saying, Christian, <clears throat> because um, when I was working in in the store at Metro, we had over 200 um, staff and those 200 staff were also on different shifts. Right. So um, I'm I'm sure and a lot of other people are feeling this in the room is that you're not always on site for a quality amount of time with those um, individuals. And so you're pretty much, for most part, for many of them, a stranger that's coming in and out, um, maybe once or twice a, a year. Um, what about, um, how could we maybe be working with the supervisor and management team because there's more of them inside the works place in order to create that culture of care. What's your suggestions for maybe that route? Beautiful. Um, and yeah, one, really... there was a comment as well, actually make, making a similar point where, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with 250 people on site, you know, how can you, um, how can you deal with this at, at scale rather than on that one-to-one -one basis? Sure. Um, and of course, in the business that I run, there's three key elements to what we do. The first one is strategy. So how do we have a strategic approach connected to business objectives? And that very much needs to take the culture where it's at and see who are the key individuals that are influencers in the business. And it might not be your manager. It might be the guy that people just go and talk to, right? He might be the guy that could just use a little bit of training and, and you know, because people are gravitating to that person anyway. So strategically, you kind of want to think, okay, who are the key people? And then what is the training that is needed? And not just training on the worst case scenario of the, what are the suicide statistics, but what are the practical and uplifting ways that I notice and check in on my people on a daily basis, not just waiting and like being like a meerkat trying to check for signs and symptoms of poor mental health, right? I call it the meerkat effect, which is what, what we're often doing, right? 
So, um, but, but then if you've got those 200 people, like don't underestimate the power of the, the interactions that you have with five to 10 people. And if that's powerful enough, what that ripple effect is outwards, right? And so when I talk to somebody for 30 minutes, I'm going to probably ask them something about their soul or their purpose or something that's a bit deeper than, again, the, 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 the weather or uh, the weekend, right? And, and, and that makes an impression. People are like, oh, this person is brave enough to ask me what's going good in my life or what am I grateful for or how can they help? Things like that. So it's like active listening. Uh, and the ability to ask empowering questions, but also to lead by example. And so it's how we live our life that is contagious and affects other people. And equally, of course, uh, we want to then empower individuals. We, we, you know, I'm a big advocate for uh, leadership and management training to support those interpersonal skills that Christian talked about, because we can't do this alone, but we've got to talk to each other because we're all on the same side. Yeah. Um, that's that's uh, some good some good um, ideas and, and concepts there, and it's yeah it's going through the chat. There's definitely people asking questions about that, so I'm glad we covered um, we covered that one off. Uh, Christian, you've got your hand up again. Did you want to um, ask another question? Okay. All right. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, I'm sure. Um, uh, what What about a situation where you have the 200 teams and you have Within that 200 teams, you have a sub teams, and within those sub teams, you have safety champions. So uh, within those safety champions, those sub teams can communicate with themselves, and um, this can actually get to you as probably the head or the manager of safety, and the issue could be addressed. So what do you think? I think that will probably fall under the area of the strategy, having safety champions within those uh, uh, the 200 teams that are probably within the 200, 200 teams, you have sub teams. What so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, everyone's going to have slightly different structures, but I think we'll relate to, you know, there's all these different pockets, these different teams and safety champions are great. Get them some well-being champion training as well. Just add to their skill set if they're already passionate about what they do. Um, perhaps that might be a different group of people. I know some people have mental health first aiders. I quite like the champion or ambassador approach because it's more about that uplifting and i see this note from from matthew just around mental health needing a rebrand so it's like to rebrand that it's not just the mental illness suicide bit but it's actually how do we all look out for each other and invest in our own well-being in order to consistently perform so certainly whatever's in your group your 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 organization if there's um pieces like that safety champions just add to their skill set or see if there's a particular skill set you need um on the ground with the people We've spoken a bit about kind of things when they've got to the more serious end, shall, shall we say. Um, but I know that, and, and you touched on this earlier about how your mental wellness can affect the uh, likelihood of, a, of a, an accident or an incident happening, for example. Um, yeah. I know that there's a big, big issue with presenteeism. Um, what, what's your view on on that and, and how do we approach that? And is it kind of the same way, be proactive, have those conversations, or is there something a bit different about presenteeism? So for people who don't know, presenteeism is when you show up at work, but you're not really being productive, but you're there, you're clocking in, you're clocking out, but you're not really, um, and it's costing the business money, right? Um, and this makes me think Vincent has been making some cool comments. Thank you, Vincent. Um, just around, I think you said something like, whatever happened to, you know, meaningful work that is safe and that, you know, um, allows you the environment to, to boost your mental health. And I completely agree with that. We kind of check out when we don't feel um, included, when we're treated poorly, or we don't have autonomy over our job, um, or when we're really stressed. So when we're really stressed, and you'll probably know this, but your body goes into fight, flight, or freeze, right? And these days, stress is coming from work, but it's also coming from our devices that have notifications going all the time, telling us what the worst things in the world that are happening. Bad news travels six times faster than good news, apparently. Um, and so no wonder people are 
um, in a state of overwhelm. Now, when you're when you're in a state of fight or flight or stress, you are unable to make creative decisions that allow you to do great work, resource and recover yourself. You can push yourself really hard and override your system for a little while, but that's to your point, Christian, when, when accidents um, occur. So presenteeism is a big thing because it's individual, but it's also systemic. So what is the, or how does the organization motivate or incentivize good work? And so, I mean, there's lots of nuance there, but those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, um, th that is a challenge that people are grappling with, you know, and uh, we all have days when we're more or less productive. You know, I certainly have days where I um, am sort of really on it and I get loads done and I have other days where it's a real struggle to, um, to to get anything productive done at all um and you know i'm kind of fortunate that i've got my own business and i can sort of ride that wave a little bit but okay. you know it's not easy to do that if you're in a job i'm sure um tamara i'm just gonna yeah i just wanted to um bring forward the idea about exclusion and ostr being ostracized mm -hmm. and how um impactful it can be on emotionally eroding and breaking people down we we often think like oh well it's not such a big deal because they have supports maybe outside of work but when you stop and you think how how much time we spend in work for most people it's more than 8 hours and we are um tribal beings Totally. And if you look historically, we used um, ostracizing somebody from the tribe as a punishment. Can we maybe dig into that a little bit? Because that's a real critical issue that's also being overlooked. It's a big one. It's a big one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's a big one because there's the micro version, which is sort of um, triggers and how we are, how we react to people. And I say triggers like that word is way too overused these days, mm. but a trigger just means that a reaction that you're having to a situation is bigger than what the situation actually calls for. And so when we're stressed as well, um, when we have little, um, I want to say little conflicts, that sounds like an oxymoron, but little um, challenges with, with somebody, um, they can feel significantly bigger because we're stressed, we're in sort of attack mode, we're in that fight or flight sort of place. And so um, Dr. Brené Brown says, it's hard to hate people up close. And so there's something in a skill that takes bravery, which is leaning in, even when people maybe don't agree with our views. And we're becoming very... Um, black and white and polarized just in the world. If we look at the political landscape, if we look at um, inclusion even, you know, you're either on this side or you're on this side. And this is like workplace is just a microcosm of that bigger global kind of challenge that we're seeing these days. And so it does start with us as far as leaning in to some of the topics that are outside of our algorithms, right? That are just feeding us stuff that, that allows us to agree with ourselves the whole time. Um, so, and I certainly agree with you because I, I mean, I grew up in a cult. That's how you, you got rid of people. You ostracized them, you bullied them, mm. you made them feel unimportant and like they didn't exist. Right. And, and, and people's mental health is still struggling today, even if they've left 20 years ago. So huge issue. I mean, a big side issue, which is just inclusion and whose responsibility is it, but I probably leave it there for now just because of the sake of time, but, but um, connect with me on LinkedIn. We can talk more. Yeah, no. That, uh, well, I was going to say uh, when the end, uh, at the end of this, uh, what's a good way to continue the conversation? So there we go. Connect, uh, connect on on LinkedIn. Definitely, uh, definitely a good way forward. Um, you mentioned the the piece around digital health, digital well being, and, and you're writing a, a book on this. Um, I think, and you you just touched on that there in terms of the the speed of news traveling and notifications and so on. Um, is this kind of technological change potentially the biggest? disruptive influence on people's mental health that's happened you know ever um yes and 
Um, yes, and like if you see The Social Dilemma on Netflix, which is a documentary about the topic, there's this horrific correlation between um, like young people's mental health and the start of Instagram and some of the, and like literally suicide and self-harm just spikes exactly correlating to, to when certain social platforms um, sort of uh, opened up. I would point you in the direction, and I quote them a lot in, in my upcoming book, the Center for Humane Technology um, gives loads of insight and information, bite-sized statistics, but also things to think about. Um, but two things, I the world of work needs to be disrupted, right? We need to yeah. disrupt the world of work and the world of education because it is an old model that is made for factory work and you know mm -hmm. the old way of working. With technology, like I, I actually, so unfortunately I feel like it might get worse before it gets better, but I'm yeah. actually an optimist about the future of work because I think we need these disruptors where everyone gets a little bit scared and a bit shaken up in order to go, oh, maybe there's another way to do things. I saw a comment just around meeting culture and like huge inefficiencies in the workplace. And group think means people just aren't questioning them in a proactive way. They might be complaining to their partner, but not actually going, hey, is there a better way to do this that's actually more efficient? So I have two young adults now as well, uh, 20 and, and 18. So I've certainly been on the journey um, with them about um, their interaction. But when I talk to people, grown-ups who are my age and older, we're also saying, oh my God, I'm so frazzled. It's whether it's your emails or whether it's your phone, whatever it is, it is eroding our ability and our skills for connection. Con lack of connection is the thing that's messing with our mental health. So technology can be used for good, but it's lack of real true connection that is really messing with our mental health. Those are the summary points from my upcoming mm, book mm, but i can obviously yeah. rant on this topic a lot well um perhaps when the book's out we'll um we'll get you on and do an, do a, just do an interview and, and talk specifically um specifically about that so it's interesting isn't it so it's coming but coming down to i guess being being more present and what can we do to be more present and and, and connect with people and um, i want to move us away from the gimmicky yeah, because it's like, be more present, meditate, like do these things like, and I'm all for meditation, don't get me wrong. But I feel like we're get we're layering on these well being practices as if we always have to do more well being. And actually, yeah. it's about letting go a little bit and learning to sit with yourself and listen to your own body. That's what we've forgotten how to do. What do I need right now? You know, and if doing one small thing that you need is going to be more powerful than doing 22 things that an influencer told you to do and feeling frazzled at the end of it. Right. And for me, the two key non-negotiables for my well-being are honesty and accountability. There's no bubble baths or, or lighting candles. It's honesty and accountability. Right. And for mm. everyone else. And I wonder if, if I don't. Do you mind if I ask everyone a question yeah. to throw into the chat box? I'd love, because I, I see um, Noala said something around breath work. I'd love to know what is your non-negotiable when it comes to your well-being. If you just throw it in the chat, because I know there's loads of you. Because um, it's good to see, well, what are other people doing? What's useful for them? Um, beautiful. Movement. Movement is the single best way that's evidence-based to prevent burnout, by the way. And we haven't really gotten yeah. into that topic, but um, I love mm. that I'm seeing some people there just talking about movement. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably mine because I I find um, well we we ironically we live quite close to one another which we didn't know until we started talking about this but um, people will often see me walking around the streets of South East London um, on the phone or or you know whatever just because I find if I'm just sort of chained to my desk that has a negative effect on on me and I feel energized by getting out and moving and even if it's just you know just walking um, but just moving gets the brain uh flowing and the, and the blood pumping and yeah beautiful i know that because i'm if i was on stage talking i would be moving around and my body would be kind of shaking out the stress of you know the the adrenaline of of, of putting myself out there um while i was talking but because i'm sitting and this is the world we live in now i know like i've blocked out time after this because i've got to go outside and just shake it out because it's just it kind of stacks in your body so you have to mm. know yourself and know how to kind of burn the stress out yeah, and it looks like lots lots of people are saying something similar in the chat here about walking and sleep is a good one as well. 
Oh, sleep essential. And then um, Carol, a period of quiet and quiet space. You know, we've got extroverts, we've got introverts, we've got people who have different needs for types of connection or types of movement. And that's cool. But what I'd then challenge you with is you all said these beautiful things. How many of your immediate team or families know that these are the things that you need? Do we, cause that's normalizing conversations about mental health. Hey, I need a good night's sleep in order to perform at my best. I'm going to go to bed early just to stack up and, and do well, or I've got to go for the walk or do the thing, right? That's how normal it is in my business to, we, we go, Hey, what do you, what's one thing you're doing to invest in your well being today? Or if we're doing something stress, stressful, we'll say, um, how are you going to complete the stress cycle? Now that's a language from um, burnout specialisms, which is stress builds, you've got to burn it out. And so normalizing those kinds of sentences, a bit weird at first, but now my team, the most junior person asks me, you know, like, what are you doing for your mental health, Petra? You know, um, that's the world I want to live in where it's that normalized to check in on each other. Hmm. There's some yeah more more stuff flooding in in the chat, so that's good. Got, we've got people talking, so that's that's always a good start. Um, before we wrap up, uh, Petro, and I really enjoyed it and appreciate your time today. Um, what would you say uh, in terms of how can people learn a bit more about you and what you do? And, and you mentioned LinkedIn, but feel free to kind of plug any any other things. Uh, and then, sure. have you got any particular, um, you know? resources or frameworks or, or sort of top two or three things that people could sort of take away from this and go and go and think about and, and, and sort of implement to try and make this a bit practical. So um, this sounds like a shameless plug, but it's actually resources. Um, I have a TED talk that's on YouTube that's called Three Ways to Live the Life You Want. And I've got go. three very practical ways for you to um, think about your own well-being. And it's just sometimes a perspective shift going, what do I want more of? Not just what do I want less of? LinkedIn is my happy place. So I'm I'm always on there and um, I'd love to connect with as many of you as possible. And um, I mean, my website's just my name, petravelzebor.com, where you can see more about training and the other stuff that we do. That would be cool. Good stuff. LinkedIn's also my happy place, but taking on a point you mentioned earlier, um, on my phone, I've actually deactivated all my notifications on LinkedIn. Um, I'd really love to deactivate my email notifications, but I feel I kind of can't get over that as a as a as a next step. But um, perhaps start, I'll get there start one day. small and build yeah. from there. I don't have any of the apps on my phone, like um, LinkedIn, so that I have to be at a desktop or a laptop. Um, and and I never watch the news. I know shock horror. What? How do I survive? But there are ways that you can quite radically shift the negative influences and bring in positive influences. Yeah, and you, I mean, you, you, it's an interesting one that because news is, you know, it's mostly negative stuff, isn't it? If you if you really sit back and analyze what's on what's repeat, on the six o'clock news, yeah, on repeat over and over again. So how many, like, how much is clickbait and fake news? How much mm. is actual news? And how much do you need to hear on repeat? You could probably watch the news once a week and be fully up to date on everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, mm. and I know different jobs are different, but. Oh, thanks, Tim. Sorry, Tim ordered my book. Thank you. Oh, I have a book. Yes, as well. Thank you. It's all about the books and another one on the way. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll give a shout out to Tim as well, because um, Tim's um, had some really difficult times recently. So it's great to see you back, Tim, and getting engaged. And thank you for, for joining us today. Great. Well, look, um, thanks so much, Petra. Um, really enjoyed it. I'm sure people will have got a lot from it. Um, thank you to everybody else for joining in and, and being really engaged with us as well. Um, love to see you in a couple of weeks for the next Safety Roundtable. Uh, we're switching gears. We're going from uh, well-being into insurance, where I've got uh, Robert Beasley from AXA Excel, and we're going to be speaking about um, how do insurance companies perceive safety and that there'll be some really good things to learn there and from the perspective of, you know, how can you be in the right position uh, to work as your partner with your insurer to get the best, the best deals to protect against claims and all of that kind of stuff. But um, perhaps a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, stringent topic than what we've had today. So thanks. Uh, thanks everybody. And we'll look forward to seeing you again on another episode of the safety Roundtable soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Safety and Risk Success podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit follow and do share on social media. 
does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest, even yourself? If so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.